Hey guys, welcome back to another video. Today I am covering chapter seven of the International Macroeconomics course. This is the part two, part one I've already posted. Uh, and really, chapter seven covers the ISLM FX model. And so, in the part one section, I really talked about like in depth of how the ISLM model works, in addition to how the ISLM model interacts with the FX market. Now in, in part two, we're just going to be looking at the different policy reactions that can be implemented under a fixed and floating regime, and then taking a look at a case example. So it's a much shorter video. As always, I'm working off the second edition of the Robert C. Fenstra uh, book. I've provided a link in the video description where you can buy the book if you're interested on Amazon. As always, please like and subscribe to the channel for more videos i really would appreciate any support if you could like the video or maybe even share it I'm not sure if you really want to share it, but i mean at least subscribe to the channel i do appreciate any support Alrighty, so let's get started so uh so now we can fully characterize an open economy that is in equilibrium in the goods money and forex market so the lm model talks about the money market, the goods market is the IS, uh, IS curve, and then the forex market is, is, is represented by the forex market. So that's just, we've already talked about this. If you do not understand this, do not proceed. Go back to part one, understand how we came up with these curves, okay? This is just for people who've watched that video. So let's go Let's go through some, uh, some examples. So macroeconomic policies in the short term. So we focus on two main policy actions, changes in monetary policy implemented through changes in the money supply and changes in a fiscal policy involving changes in government spending or taxes. So those are the two policy decisions that a country has at, uh, at its disposal at any time. The key assumption is that the policies are temporary and will not impact the long run expectations for the exchange. Rate. So the examples that we're going to be going through do not impact the long the long run expected exchange rate. You know that when we talked about the FX market, we talked about how there are three uh, endogenous inputs to the model. There is the uh, the foreign interest rate, there's the domestic in interest rate, and then there's the expected exchange rate. In these policies, all that all that will be changing. Everything that any any of the changes that we'll be making will not impact the um, the expected exchange rate. So that's very important to understand. So let's talk about expansion here, an expansion in the money supply under a floating exchange rate. And so this is monetary policy. A temporary monetary expansion that increases the money supply will shift the LM curve to the right, causing interest rates to fall. This means that the domestic returns will also fall. As the interest rate falls, th therefore increasing investment, and the exchange rate depreciates, therefore increasing the trade balance, demand increases, which corresponds to the move down the IS curve. So let's look at this you know, through a graph. So we're starting at initial equilibrium at one, which is at Y1, over here is the output level, and at uh, an interest rate of I1. Now, with an expansion in the money supply, the LM curve shifts to the right because in the short term prices are fixed, and therefore you will see that uh, if we move the MS uh, line to the right, the uh, equilibrium interest rate will fall. Right, so the LM curve will shift, uh, shift to the right, and it will shift down the uh, the IS curve at a new equilibrium point of two. At this equilibrium point, the interest rate falls and output expands. So in the FX market, this fall in the interest rate lowers the, the domestic returns and therefore the new equilibrium exchange rate is at a higher level. So E will be higher at the equilibrium level. That represents a real depreciation, okay? So that's an expansion in the money supply. So by increase under a floating uh, exchange rate. So under a floating exchange rate, if you increase the money supply in the short term, it will lower the interest rate. It will expand output. It will um, it will uh, create a uh, a real depreciation in the currency, and it will lower domestic returns. Okay. So a temporary monetary expansion under floating rates is effective in combating uh, economic downturns by boosting output. It raises output at home, lowers the interest rate, and causes a depreciation of the exchange rate. Now, what about monetary policy under fixed uh, a fixed exchange rate? The key to understand uh, is, uh, if you recall the uncovered interest parity condition, the UIP parity condition, the home interest rate under a fixed exchange rate system must equal the foreign interest rate Okay, 
Monetary policy under fixed exchange rates is impossible to undertake. Fixing the exchange rate means giving up monetary uh, autonomy. As the MS increases and shifts the LM curve to the right, the lower interest rates deviates from the foreign interest rate and therefore breaking that peg. So if you are pegging, uh, if a country is pegging to a, a, a another currency, they need to equate their domestic interest rate with that of the foreign market. Because we're assuming under the UIP condition that uh, the rate of depreciation of the currency remains zero and therefore the foreign interest rate must equal the domestic interest rate. So if we at all expand the money supply, what that does is it lowers the interest rate and that deviates from that peg. We need to equal the um, the foreign interest rate. And therefore, it is impossible. We get, we've get we given up the, the possibility of pursuing monetary policy when we fix our exchange rate. So as you can see in the, in the graph, if we were to expand the money supply as before, the LM curve would shift right and down and it, the, the new equilibrium uh, interest rate would be at 0.2 over here at I2. But we need to equate the domestic return, the, the, uh, the domestic um, interest rate with the foreign interest rate. So if the foreign interest rate remains at I1 and we fall to I2, what will happen is that there will be significant selling pressure on our currency and it would break the peg. So in order to support the peg, we need to remain at that level. Okay. So uh, what about fiscal policy under a floating exchange rate? So what if there was a temporary increase in government spending, G? So an increase in G shifts the IS curve to the right, causing the interest rate to rise and therefore also increasing the domestic returns. The higher interest rate attracts capital inflows, which causes the domestic currency to appreciate. So E falls which will encourage consumers to switch from more expensive goods to domestic goods, so TB falls. And so illustrating this uh, increase in G, so an increase in G impacts the IS curve, and we talked about this in the, in the previous video in part one. And so I shifts to the right and upwards. And so as it shifts along the LM curve, the new point at point two, uh, increases the equilibrium interest rate in the ISLM market, and therefore that also increases the domestic return. In a floating exchange, you don't need to peg your nominal interest rate uh, to a foreign interest rate because you, your currency is floating. So by increasing uh, your domestic return, it also uh, uh, increases the strength of your currency, and therefore there is appreciation in the exchange rate and E falls and the new equilibrium point in the FX market as it is at a lower E, so at point two, okay? So the LM curve does not change in this scenario. With government spending, G increases and therefore it pushes out the IS curve. It, the new e equilibrium point is at a, nom a nominal or a real interest rate of I2 that increases the domestic return and therefore it causes a, a, a uh, appreciation in the currency. So the new equilibrium currency it results in an appreciation and also an expansion of output as you can see by the increase from Y1 to Y2. So. What about fiscal policy under fixed exchange rates? So same thing as before, an increase in G. Recall that the interest parity condition. So the domestic interest rate must equal the foreign interest rate for the peg to hold. And so let's before we actually read that slide, let's try to think of what would happen. So this is once again under floating exchange rate. If we increase E, the IS curve shifts to the right. And therefore the equilibrium interest rate is at a higher level, right, at I2. But under a fixed exchange rate, we can't change the I in our market un unless, you know, the I in the foreign market also increases because then the peg would break. So we need to make sure that I gets back to I1. So even if we increase G to, to the point over here, we need to counteract that and somehow get it back to this level right over here. And I mean, we could not pursue G and therefore the IS curve would not shift or in this scenario and what happens here is that you increase G, so you increase your I and then in addition to that, you also pursue expansionary monetary policy and shift your uh, your LM curve down into the right. And so that will push uh, I from uh, point one to point this point over here. And then with LM shifting right and down, it pushes it all the way back to here. And so what happens is that your I remains the same net of both the increase in G and the monetary expansion, your output increases significantly from Y1 to Y2. And 
the, the domestic returns stay the same. So your equilibrium exchange rate still remains at that fixed level. So the peg does not break. And so we'll just read this slide now. So recall the interest parity condition. The domestic interest rate must equal the foreign interest rate for the peg to hold. A temporary increase in G shifts the IS curve to the right, which increases the real interest rate. To counteract this increase in the interest rate, monetary authorities must intervene by shifting the LM curve rightwards to reduce the equilibrium in, uh, uh, interest rate. And that's what is being done over here. In the end, the interest rate and exchange rate are left unchanged in the fixed system, whereas output expands dramatically from Y1 to Y2. This, in the long term, can create inflationary problems. But under a fixed exchange rate, fiscal policy is super effective. So it is much more effective than under floating exchange rates. Okay, so in a floating exchange rate regime, autonomous monetary and fiscal policy is feasible. The power of monetary policy comes from two forces, lower interest rates to boost investment demand and a depreciated currency to boost the trade balance. And so when the currency depreciates, uh, the demand for exports increases because, you know, domestic products become cheaper relative to foreign goods and therefore people are buying more exports. Right. In a fixed exchange rate system, fiscal policy is incredibly effective to expand output, whereas monetary policy is ineffective. It is impossible. Any any additional additional dollar sold into the market a monetary expansion must be bought back by the, the central bank because if you increase the supply of those dollars the the currency will depreciate so e will increase and it will break that peg so if a dollar if the the bank chooses to print five extra dollars they have to buy five extra dollars from the market so it is ineffective and just impossible to pursue uh, monetary policy under a fixed exchange rate so these policies and these discussions that we're having encompass the stabilization policy, and it is the ability of monetary authorities to influence economic output through changes in monetary or fiscal policy. The policies must be used with care. If the economy is stable and growing, an additional temporary monetary fiscal stimulus may cause an unsustainable boom that will then, uh, w that will, when the stimulus is withdrawn, turn into an undesirable bust. So, you know, with stabilization policy, central bank authorities can kind of play around. Under a floating regime, they can play around with monetary policy and talk to the government and kind of uh, pursue fiscal expansion. But in the long term, if the government abuses that, it can create inflationary problems. But at the end of the day, whether you, your country is under a fixed or floating exchange rate regime, stabilization policy essentially says, OK, if there is an economic shock, how can I use either fiscal or monetary policy to respond to that shock. Or if I want to stimulate my economy, economy to get to a point, what can I do? And that's what's considered stabilization policy. So now let's look at an example. So at the end of 1997, this was the Asian crisis. You probably read this in the textbook. At the end of 1997, following the Asian crisis, we saw many industrialized Asian economies suffer domestic shocks. Australia and New Zealand were at risk. Both countries depended heavily on the export demand from these Asian economies. And with demand falling because of the recessions that were happening in Asia, this changed the goods market equilibrium. Well, what happened? If, if Australian and New Zealand governments chose to ignore the Asian crisis, their economies would have contra contracted as the IS curves shifted leftwards in reaction to a fall in the trade balance. Because as those economies, the Asian economies continue to suffer in the recession and their crisis, they, the demand for uh, for imports for them, so the demand of uh, the exports for you know Australia and New Zealand would have fallen, and therefore the trade balance would fall. So home interest rates would have fallen, their currency would have depreciated, and you know equilibrium output and a recession would have occurred because output would have fallen. So the central bank instead responded with expansionary monetary policy by shifting the LM curve right. This stabilization. Uh, strategy, the, the objective was to stabilize output. And this is an example of stabilization policy. So not only do they have to worry about domestic shocks, but they have to look at, okay, we depend on this Asian market for, for sending some of our domestic output to them. So our, our exports depend on these Asian countries. We anticipate these Asian countries to see a, a fall in demand from them. So we know that if we don't do anything, our output will fall. So we need to react by focusing on a stabilization policy with the objective of controlling output. And that's what they did. So what happened is when the when the demand eventually fell because of the crisis, the IS curve shifted right, and the uh, uh, the um, 
uh, Australian and New Zealand central bank reacted by shifting the LM curve right. Uh, right. So the IS curve shifted left and the LM curve shifted right. Okay, so let's start off at point one over here, the initial blue line. So the LM and IS curve. So the first move, the IS curve shifted right because of the fall in uh, export demand. At point two, they were below what the output they were targeting or what they wanted it to be at. So they reacted by shifting the LM curve to the right. And that shift, the intersection of the new IS and LM curve was at the point at the, of output where they wanted. What happened in addition to this expansion, the, the interest rate fell. Uh, the, the the interest rate fell, which lowered uh, domestic returns, and therefore um, uh, the new equilibrium exchange rate depreciated, and it was at a higher E, and that eventually stimulated uh, export demand later on. So this policy was uh, this was a successful stabilization endeavor, which saw the home exchange rates depreciate significantly, which paired with non-Asian demand helped uh, support the trade balance. At the same time, inflation remained low and the rate of unemployment was reduced further because of this expansionary policy, which helped grow domestic demand. So, you know, with inflation uh, being lowered as the interest rate fell and investment being stimulated by the cost of investment falling, the, the, the both uh, Australia and New Zealand were able to weather this storm, which would have impacted their economy significantly. So now, what are some problems in policy de design and implementation? What are some challenges when actually thinking of the stabilization policy that you want to pursue, right? Because there are a bunch of central bankers, and they'll be like, okay, well, what can we realistically sell both to, you know, my counterparts and to the overall economy that people will believe? So in it, so policy constraints are the first one. Policymakers may not always be free to apply the policies they desire, fixed exchange rate rules, interest rate rules, and balanced budget rules, place limits on policies. So whether there's limits, uh, budget limits uh, with fiscal policy, or, there, or there's monetary limits because you're under a fixed exchange rate regime, there are several policy constraints that you might need to consider. In addition, there's incomplete information and inside lag, which essentially the, uh, the model assumes that policymakers have full knowledge of, st uh, of the state of the economy. However, this is not true. On the monetary side, uh, there, there may be a delay in the policy meetings. So this inside lag means the inside lag essentially means there's a delay between, you know, when the shock occurs and when you can actually implement a policy, whereas the outside lag we'll talk about later on here uh, represents when you implement the policy up to the point where how, how long does it take for that policy to have effect, right? And so there's a lot of incomplete information. There's a lot of delayed information in addition to the inside lag, which may be limited by the different policy meetings and, you know, bureaucratic uh, slow slowness of governments. In addition, there's the policy response and outside lag. So even once policies are implemented, the time it takes to see out those results is unknown. With personal agendas, this can complicate things. So not only does economic data lag, you know, when you when you... Uh, increased government spending, you know, there's not an instantaneous jump in output. It the, it takes maybe two, three quarters for that expansion in output to actually be represented in economic data. Okay. There are also other uh, limitations. So there's long-term horizon plans. There's weak links between nominal and real exchange rates, especially if the country is facing I inflationary pressure. But really the key ones are the inside, outside lag, and policy constraints. Those are the big problems with policy design. Other than that, that's pretty much it for Chapter 7. There's two parts, as I, I've said before. Uh, as always, if you're interested in buying the book, please do check out the Amazon link in the video description. If you are interested in reading some of my research, please check out Seeking Alpha, where I've published uh, a lot of uh, macroeconomic reports on different emerging markets. And if you are interested in that and interested in getting into the financial industry, I do recommend that you check out that uh, uh, that research. And as always, if, if, if you're interested in asking any questions, please comment below, like the video, subscribe, and send me a message. And I'll be sure to get back to you on whether it's this course or some of the research that I've published. Have a great day, guys.